event for The Perfect Other, which centers around Kylie Luddy's sister's sister and her battle with schizophrenia, is a hybrid event with audience members here with us in our community room and also joining us virtually via Crowdcast. Hello to our Crowdcast members. If you are with us virtually, please know that you can use the chat function or the question and answer function in Crowdcast to convey comments and questions and we will relay them to the speakers. We are monitoring the chat and we'll answer your questions as they come as we can. So tonight's book event uh, is about a memoir. It's a memoir event that covers a range of topics, including the mental health care system, neuroscience, and grief. But at its core, it is mostly a story about sisterhood and about love. Kylie Luddy is here tonight with us, and she is joined tonight for the discussion with author and memoirist Amy Jo Burns. We're going to uh, have Amy, <coughs> Jo, and Kylie in discussion for most of the evening, but we're going to have Kylie come up and give a brief introductory reading. Let me introduce our panelists. Amy Jo Burns is the discussant, and she is the author of the memoir Cinderland and the novel Shiner, which was a Barnes & Noble Discover pick and an NPR Best Book of the Year. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review, uh, Daily, Tin House, Elle, Good Housekeeping, Electric Literature, and the anthology Not That Bad, among many others. Kylie Letty, the author, is a graduate of Boston College and is currently pursuing an MSW at Columbia University in advanced clinical practice and public policy. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Parents, and other publications. She is based in New York City, and The Perfect Other is her first book, and we're so pleased to be welcoming this new author here to the Princeton Public Library for her event. So come on up and give us a little sample of the book before we take a discussion. Thank you so much. Am I close enough to this, Snyder? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's so nice to have everyone here. Um, this is my first time doing something like this, so... I'm a little rusty, bear with me. I did the audiobook recently, and it was the hardest experience of my life. <laughs> I will never listen to it, and I learned to slow down, so I'm trying to read slowly, so I try just to rush through it. <laughs> I begin at the last chapter, actually. I thought I was writing this book to make my sister's life matter, but it already does. There are people who split a pole and think of her. She was a sister, certainly, but she was also a daughter, a friend, a patient, a comedian, an artist, a muse. Kate loved butterflies, so now I think back to the butterfly effect and the ripples of her life that I will never know. My sister mattered like everyone in this world matters, whether or not there are books written or buildings named in memoriam. The notion that we are capable of changing the world is both arrogant and obvious. Of course, we change every life we meet, just not always in the grand gestures we expect. In the morning, mom takes her coffee by the front windows or outside the deck and looks upon the stretch of green bushes and sliver of blue where the sky meets the sea. She hopes to someday start a kind of... <laughs> She hopes to someday start a kind of retreat center, building a community so no one has to feel as alone as we did. She wants families to know that they must help themselves before they can help their loved ones. She wishes to create a vacuum away from the chaos, if even just for a day of respite. Whether or not she ever opens this foundation, my sister lives on through her. She is in the heart-shaped rocks and shells and bits of sea glass on the front steps. She is in the careful way my mom and I still, between us, call the spare bedroom Kate's room and not the guest room, even though my sister did not know this house long enough to make it her own. She is in the rose bush we planted on a trellis near her window. The wind is too strong for the pink flowers to fully prosper, but still, she is there. My sister is in the way I dress, the colors I choose, how I am challenged to be a more original, truer version of myself. She is in the moments where I say yes to an adventure instead of no. I feel her when that song is playing in the car and everyone is singing along, and I'm reminded of what it is to be alive. Or when the fog rolls in, turning the trees into skinny silhouettes, and the sun hangs low in a red summer sky. I see her in what is beautiful, or interesting, or sad. 
which is to say that I see her in everything. She is nowhere tangible, which is to say that she is everywhere. We keep and keep and keep. We remember and remember and remember. We collect heart-shaped shells and signs and old notebooks and recollections. We hold on, memorize the lines of her tan, slender hands and the sound of her laugh, engraving ourselves with the smallest details, lest we ever forget. We try to make amends, reason with ghosts, explain ourselves to the wind. And then there comes a time when we must let go. This is the end goal after all. This is what the grief self-help books and psychologists and religious advisors and experts of many cultures tell us is necessary. Only after we relinquish what is lost are we truly healed. I must let her run in front of me, stop chasing after her footsteps in the sand. Or maybe it is me who must have passed her now. This book cannot resurrect or preserve as I once thought the point of literature. All it can do is bury. This is the true meaning of rest in peace. Let her rest. Let her be gone. Stop calling her back. Let her finally have some peace. After everything, she deserves to be at peace. So I let her go. Still, she goes on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kylie. That was beautiful. What a beautiful reading. What a wonderful way to start our time together. Um, you know, uh, this book is getting such wonderful love and press. You know, Kirk has said it's moving and deeply felt. Book list said it's exceptionally thoughtful and insightful. You have, if you haven't seen it, there's a beautiful spread in People Magazine um, about Kylie and her story and her family. Um, for me personally, when I read it, it just felt like it's such a stunning portrait of a family in flux, and it's a truthful and compassionate account of mental illness. Um, it's also a gripping meditation on loss, and so I'm so lucky and thrilled that I get to ask you some questions tonight with this group um, and to celebrate what is truly uh, such a beautiful work of art. So, um, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I thought a great place to start would be the title. The Perfect Other. Um, I love it, and I would love to hear how that title came to you, what it, what it represents, maybe for people here who haven't read the book or maybe haven't heard too much about it. Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> Thank you. And also, I want to say before I get anything else that I'm officially your fan, no. so I brought a book for you to sign <laughs> before you leave. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the title was very important to me. Um, it came about kind of after a long time of yeah. brainstorming. My agent came up with it in the end. But um, the meaning behind it is essentially that, you know, my sister had so many resources. You know, we had a lot of privilege. In some ways, she was perfect. She was a perfect patient. We had so many people willing to help, help her and you know, look for answers. And even though we had that privilege, it still wasn't enough to save her. Mm -hmm. So it was still othering with mental illness, and um, I think it just highlights kind of why I wanted to write the book, which is to shine a spotlight and hopefully illuminate other people's stories who, you know, are suffering more than my sister was. Yes. Well, love it. Love it. Um, and it always seems like sometimes it takes, you have to kind of write the whole book before you're able to decide what the one to two to three word title should be. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's still like another title online. You know, really? Can you tell us <laughs> what it was or, or is, it a, is it a secret? It doesn't really make sense. No okay. Really. <laughs> yeah. It's called The Origin of Seashells. Mm -hmm. It's a little different, a little mm -hmm. more literary thing. Yeah. yeah. This one I think just encompasses It more. does. It does. Um, it, you know, something that I also appreciated about the book is that, you know, and oftentimes memoirs or memoirs do this, but it's about what happened, but it's also about how you remember what happened. The act of carrying those memories with you and something beautiful that Kylie does in the book is that each section um, is given a color and I was wondering could you just tell us a little bit about that it's so beautiful oh thank you um, yeah so I divided the book into different sections I did it based on phases of schizophrenia and I wanted to give like a clinical lens in that sense mm -hmm. but I think that when you're living through things nothing feels clinical or like there's a roadmap for you so I wanted to kind of give it pair it with something that was more um, intangible, mm -hmm. which is to me like colors and associations and um, kind of like how we 
clump together memories. I think that when you go back and you try to align your life into specific moments and create a narrative, you feel, you realize that things are less clean than yes. there, you know, yes. which is what life is. So yes. I want to be like that. So I wanted to show the messy and humanism. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I totally get that. And I think, you know, along the same lines, something that's really strange is when you have to take those memories that you've carried or take your life and turn it into scenes, mm -hmm. right? And take the people um, that you love and turn them into characters. Can you can you tell us what that process was like for you, you know, taking things that you've lived with and trying to put them on the page? Yeah, definitely. I remember the first time my editor said characters to me. Yeah. <laughs> kind of jarred by Yeah. It. Um, but at a certain point, I think maybe it's helpful to have that distance yeah. and try to think about it with a little objectivity that's not possible. Um, but for me, trying to pinpoint scenes, um, a lot of it was really looking at my memories and then kind of fact check them <laughs> with my mom's memories yes. and trying to find documents and things to verify. Um, old records, medical records, um, you know, we documented half our lives on our phones. So yeah. going through my sister's Facebook and my own Facebook, like <laughs> it was a lot of kind of like this piecing together, mm -hmm. um, which in the end I think brought me some closure too in a way because you start to see patterns come up and it starts making more sense retroactively. Like yes. in the moment, it really didn't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, I wanted to ask about your mom because um, you know, at some point in the book, you call yourself an unreliable narrator with silhouettes for memories. Uh, which is, is so beautiful and so apt because for, you know, a lot of the book, like you said, you're living through it, but you're also young, you know, and, 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 and you're looking at your sister who's, who's five years older. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like to go through some of those documents with your mom? Yeah, um, it was hard. <laughs> you have the you who wrote it, right? And then you have the you now who's talking about the you who wrote it, who was writing about the you who lived it, right? So it's a very... Um, it is, <laughs> and I, it is meta, and and I think you know you reflect that in the book when you talk about ha needing to have a splintered self and a separate self, and how that is so necessary sometimes for survival. But there comes a time when that splintered self maybe is not serving you, and I was wondering if through the process of writing, how do you feel about that having two selves? Do you feel like you still need them? Um, are they gone? Do they come back? Because I think writing a memoir it really pushes you to have to take yourself apart, you know? Um, so I'd just love to hear what you think about that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that there's like two parts to that maybe. Yeah. Um, one part I think is writing the book and then there is selling the book. Yes. <laughs> Which gets yes. kind of weird sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, pressure is so personal. Yes. You're having to talk about, you know, you're trying to simplify stories into these like little bite lines mm -hmm. and that can be hard. Um, for me, though, I also think that when you write something really personal, people think they know you, yeah. and they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like there's a limit. There's like a point to me where I'm like, I'm very hard on myself in the book. Um, mm -hmm. When my professors read it and said the only person I'm hard on is myself, mm -hmm. and that's like a purpose. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but I think that um, you know people like think they have an impression of you, and they meet you, maybe it's different. And I actually don't mind that. Yeah. Like, I'm kind of like this is what I need to say. It's out there. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to another author recently who was saying that once the book is no longer yours, like it's in bookstores, it's mm -hmm. printed, it's out there, you feel this kind of loss. Yeah. Um, it's no longer something that belongs to you, and I'm so excited for it not to belong to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm like, please take it. Yeah. So I feel a lot of relief. Yes. You know, something I noticed that when you write about your life, and then even when you go through some of the crucible publishing it, there's something that happens that the act of doing that, the act of remembering what happened takes on a particular weight that lessens that burden of of the memory itself. And so it's sort of like you end up having two things, you know, you have what happened, but then you have what you made of it, you know, and it doesn't necessarily, I think, like, lessen the pain that you carry, but it helps you hold it in a different way. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, um, you know, as we've been saying, this is a book about sisters and how, you know, sisters can often define themselves in relation to each other and you guys when you read the book you'll see there's just so many beautiful moments when we see Kate in all her complexity and all her beauty and how Kylie continues to sort of draw herself up you know in in contrast to that in, in the same way and it is it's just stunning and um, you know you write in the acknowledgments this is at the end of the book that the, the book itself is a love letter to her sister it's a love letter to Kate um, what do you think she would think of I like to think that she would love it. Mm -hmm. um, 
the cover actually is an old modeling photo of my sister. Yeah, put it up there. And um, there's one there, but I think that was really meaningful to me. Originally, yeah. we were thinking about doing like a family photo, and mm -hmm. I really didn't like that. I didn't want to be on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it registered me. But I think that um, having this like beautiful photo of her in the cover, especially and seeing it in bookstores and just seeing people get to know her yes. in a way, and I think have empathy for her. Mm -hmm. and I think, I think she would be honored. I, I know that when she was alive, she when she was co cognizant of what was happening to her, she would say that she wishes she could be a poster child or she wishes she could mm -hmm. do something and advocate. And it was really important to her. And people looked up to her, you know. So yeah. It was this like natural role for her to follow. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, she just never got to that point. Yeah. It was too hard. Yeah. So I'm hoping that she, I, I feel like we're doing it together in my mind. Yes. That's why I feel. Yes. Um, if I didn't feel like I had her permission, mm -hmm. I don't think I could have done it. Yeah. But things were just like, you know, weird signs, little things like yeah. that during the process. Yeah. That made it feel like a, no, no. It made, made it feel like a partnership. Absolutely. You guys sound a little woo-woo now. No, <laughs> you don't. I think, I think that it's it's an elegy, you know, and it's it, it's meaningful. And, and I, I mean, that's that's what I got from reading it, at least. And um, so since there are people here who haven't yet had the pleasure of reading the book, do you think, could you tell us, do you have a favorite memory, Kate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have one memory. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when I think about my sister, generally, I think about our like shared rituals. Yeah. And a lot of the book also is about sisterhood and kind of, you know, she's older than me. We She passed down so much to me. Yeah. So I think kind of more about that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. you know, her pulling into the bathroom to try makeup the first time. Like, yeah. those moments where you're really learning the world together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went to college and I kind of didn't, she passed away when I was 17, mm -hmm. turning 17. I went to college and I kind of had this fresh start where I didn't tell anyone I had a sister yeah. again. And um, I would say I was only child sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think that's so interesting because I feel so formed by my sister Yeah. in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that, I think once you're a sister, you're always a sister. Mm -hmm. So I think so much of who I am as I kind of read the last part is my sister. Yes. And, um, I think about those moments of her teaching me things. Mm -hmm. I, I have a younger sister myself, so I totally get it. Um, do you think Kate had a favorite memory of you? No, I don't know. I think she liked me better when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, I remember we were, we were six years apart, so when I was, you know, a baby, yeah. she would dress me up all the time to her yeah. clothes, and I was a little, her little doll that way. Mm -hmm. So I think if she were here today, she'd probably say, like, she misses me being cute and small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fair. <laughs> Um, I want to read a passage that I love because I think that this book is one of the best um, explorations of grief that I've read in memoir. Um, and you write that uh, grief is never a closed case. Grief is the crack in the window, the chilly draft that wafts in the night. Grief is hope in the absence of hope. Um, and you also say, you know, that having an ambiguous loss like you did you know, having Kate basically disappear, it really complicates those notions of, of grief and the grieving, grieving process. Um, so, you know, you had the particularly difficult task of carrying that grief while you wrote this book and carrying it even now, you know, as you're talking about it. Um, did you learn anything about grief, you know, throughout the process of writing the book that you didn't know before? Yeah, definitely. I think that when I looked back to, I was so young going through it, mm -hmm. that a lot of the emotions I felt felt very singular to me, or you know, like I it just felt abnormal or something was wrong. You look back now and you read things, and it's all very, you know, status quo. It's it's, it's how it happens. Um, I think a few things I learned is that you know, watching other people I love now like go through grief. Yeah, there's yeah. not really much you can do. Unfortunately, I think that's mm -hmm. one of the hard things. Is it becomes like. I don't know, it becomes everyone's own journey. Yeah. And I think you kind of have to let people go through that process. And I also think that, um, I think the book too, I talk about how, like, like there's no there's no word you can say. There's no, like, there's nothing you can really do besides just say, like, I'm here with you, I'm sitting with you. Yeah. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But I also found that um, I think our society doesn't have a very good model for dealing with grief mm -hmm. from a social level. Yeah. So, we have improved so much as society. I think that's actually we've lost a bit yeah. through history. And you know, I talk about going back to school like a day after my sister passed away. Yes. And you know, there wasn't like, there wasn't like you know a ritual there or something mm -hmm. you could do. And obviously, our situation was 
abnormal, but I still feel that way for other people who have more traditional losses, I guess. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, like, I say I wish I could have worn all black and, like, have the nail or yeah. something. Like, you know, like, something that says, like, be gentle with me while yes. I'm going through something. And yes. That's something I hope that we get better at as a society. Me too, because I think what ends up happening is that, you know, we act like it's a strength to be able to continue on when really it's it's not, you know, it can be so damaging. I mean, you, you talk so beautifully in the book about, you know, how people sort of expect you to just continue on and it's, you know, it, it's impossible, right? Yeah. yeah. And I'll um, hit you eventually. Yeah, it's going to come, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would love to know um, if there are certain books that you read either you know while while writing or things like that. You, the end of the book has a great bibliography of a lot of the texts that she references. I mean, you also mentioned briefly um, Leslie Jameson, the Empathy Exams. Um, was there? Could you tell us about one or two books that were good friends to you along the way of either living this or writing about it? Yeah, I am. Um... I had a year of magical thinking with me. Oh, yeah. Bell points, which is mm -hmm. kind of a cliche answer, but it's not. It's not. It's though. the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. Um, I'm obsessed with it. I had that around a lot. I would come with. I would actually bring books with me, and I was going to write. So I had like four books made at all times. Mm -hmm. And if I felt like I couldn't, like I wasn't, nothing was coming out for me. I couldn't think of where to start. I would read my favorite past or something, and then I would love their words so much. I'd want to write my own. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> kind of like, yeah. Strong inspiration that way. Mm -hmm. um, I also had um. Susanna Kalin's book, mm -hmm. Ran on Fire with Me. Um, she, if you don't know her book, it's an amazing memoir, and it's about her experience with encephalitis, um, which is basically just brain swelling, and how that inflammation in the brain made her have psychiatric symptoms. And it was, it's a kind of a medical mystery in a sense, mm -hmm. and she's able to recover in the end, not to spoil it, because I just didn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But she's able to recover, and she becomes an advocate for you know everyone who's suffering from mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of gave me a good idea of how to combine medical with the human. Yes, and that's kind of one thing that I kept referencing. Yes, yes, and you know it, it works so well because in the book, you know, Kate has a mental illness, but then she also has a fall and has a really serious injury, and then uh, that maybe was treated, maybe wasn't treated. Um, so. I can see how that that book it's it's just it's really wonderful that you have sort of these like clinical things that kind of came alongside you and then also these other memoirists um, and kind of along along the same lines you know now we're here we're talking you know um, but something that you write about is that silence is a really important part of your story it was a big part of your survival you know when Kate was diagnosed when she was sort of her schizophrenia had reached its height um, silence was sort of how you protected Yourself, what you felt like you were able to tell your friends at school. Um, and something I reflected on, I think, as I was reading, was that, you know, when you broke the silence, it wasn't like you talked about it once and you're like, ah, oh, good to go now. You know, we can talk. It's a process. It's a muscle, right, that you kind of have to strengthen. Um, what did it feel like when you, when you first started to say, okay, I'm going to talk about this? I think that when I was... I had a lot of doubts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a journey, and I think that the moments I felt a lot of doubt, I would try to examine like where that fear was coming from. Mm -hmm. So why am I so afraid to have this book out there? What am I afraid of my family or my friends or, you know, I'm a single lady. Yeah. Dating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what am I so afraid of people reacting to? Mm -hmm. And when I think about it, that is the stigma. Yes, like, yes. That, that, that kind of encouraged me. When I got really low, sometimes I think back to Yes why I'm feeling low, and, you know, I don't think, I said the book, like, silence has never changed anything. Yes. And mm -hmm. if it was an easy book to write, if it was an easy story to get out there, then I don't know if it would be as important. Right, so, and it wouldn't be true, right? It yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't reflect the truth of what, what your experience was. I was tempted to write a novel. <laughs> yeah. One of those letters was like, this is my life, but it's like, Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> which plenty of people do and do beautifully, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I think when it comes to, like, silence and shame and stigma, mm -hmm. and there's something really empowering about stamping your name and your face something and saying, you know, have, like, the... Being brave enough to come out and say, this is what we went through, and all of that. Yes, and say the facts The facts matter. The truth yeah. in this case matters. Yeah. Yes. I'm still working on that. Yes, <laughs> same, same. <Yeah. laughs> um, And this is kind of going back to what we were talking about before, but you also write about the important connection between the mind and body and how that often gets overlooked in terms of medical diagnosis. 
Um, could you explain that for anybody here who's maybe not familiar about what it means to have a mind and body connection? Yeah, basically, the main thing I talk about in the book is just how we've separated, I think we're getting better at this, but yeah. in the past, and yesterday, we've separated the mind from the body in the sense that mental illnesses are one thing, and then there's you know neurodegenerative diseases, mm -hmm. like dementia or Alzheimer's or anything like that. And that's that's really the same thing in my mind as schizophrenia or mental illness or bipolar disorder or whatever else you have. It's all just neurological. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I think part of me thinks that the reason we do that is because it's such a scary concept yes. to lose your sanity. Yes. In that sense, I think it's like the... We like to kind of distance itself, ourselves from it a bit and say mm -hmm. that's not going to happen to me. That's right. something else going on. But, mm -hmm. you know, my sister had a traumatic brain injury. That can happen to anybody. And that can change your personality. It can have, you know, different neurological yes. problems mm -hmm. in your life. So I, I think that, for me, it's important to talk about that element, my body connection, and also how we internalize trauma, yes. stress, mm -hmm. and everything else that we're all going through. We can all probably stop and think about how our minds are impacting our bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, and along the same lines, you also talk about the unfair representation of mental illness like schizophrenia, just in our, our culture, and sort of the damage that we do with these, you know, common phrases that we, the throwaway, right, that we use when we say, we use the word crazy, or use the word normal, or we say, you know, I want to kill myself. Um, what stigma do you think that put on you and your family and Kate? Yeah, I think that's a big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's their hard habits to break too. Yeah, like I find myself sometimes being like, you know, the weather is crazy outside. Yeah, you know, part of that's our normal speech pattern. But when you try to examine it, you think about the layers in that. Mm -hmm. or it can be kind of dismissive to like, oh, that homeless man is crazy. Like, yes, well, he's probably suffering from a neurological condition. Like, mm -hmm. he probably has something going on right now. Mm -hmm. His symptoms are bad today. Yeah. But we're not saying that. We're yeah. being crazy, which is dismissive. So I think that's definitely part of it. And I also think that, um, you know, I think therapy speak has kind of been increasing. Mm -hmm. Even, like, online, even recently, as, like, the past two years, I would say. And part of that's good because we, we're familiarizing ourselves with these terms. Yeah. We also become desensitized to them as well. Mm -hmm. So everyone's triggered, everyone has trauma, everything. Yeah. <laughs> it really becomes a joke almost, which I don't know if that's good or bad still. Yeah. It's kind of like a tricky gray area. Yeah. And it does. I am glad, though, that it's it's getting more representation, even if it's just in books or film yeah. or things like that, to sort of show the, the breadth of what it can look like. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, a question I wanted to ask is. But, you know, what do you think that we can do, just, you know, everyday humans that can make our world a more welcoming place for people like your family and people like Kate? I think that just having more compassion, um, yeah, trying to understand, again, that this is a neurological symptom somebody is going through, just the same as somebody having cancer. Yeah. And not trying to put more shame and stigma on anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I think that even now, like, during the interview process and post book and pubbing, you get questions like, oh, like, what could your parents have done differently or something oh, like that. Yeah, yeah. And those questions are so stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the reason why families don't want to come forward because mm -hmm. they're going to get blamed for something. Yes. When it can happen to anybody, it could mm -hmm. be genetic, it could be autoimmune diseases. I mean, th these things are so interconnected. Right. That um, I think trying to, and sometimes it is true, sometimes people do have trauma and it manifests in their yeah. illness. I'm not saying that's not valid, but mm -hmm. to like, jump to that conclusion or to, put that pressure on families, I think will only make people stay silent right. longer. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned in the book also in terms of schizophrenia that the third phase of it is recovery, right? And that's something that Kate didn't ultimately get the chance to experience. What what might that look like? What might recovery look like? Yeah, so I mentioned in the book that I worked one summer with a in a group home with a woman who had schizophrenia and they mm -hmm. were in late stages. And mm -hmm. they were in their like sixties. Um, so they were in recovery. Mm -hmm. But what that looked like for them was that their positive symptoms had decreased. I mean, yeah. Delusions, hallucinations, manic episodes, that was a little better. But their negative symptoms had increased. Right. Like, so that's like more health problems. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start to see how biological it is. You know, I don't know how people can deny that this is a medical condition when you yes. see someone who's like had muscle spasms. Yes. And, you know. Um, so for them, I mean, their quality of life really still wasn't great, right. which is heartbreaking to see because I felt like, 
the outcome that we had as a family is the worst outcome. Yes. But the alternative isn't that great either. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know that we have to start changing some stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, another favorite passage of mine that you have is, is, is that was actually a question because this isn't, you know, like there's, there's not a simple answer here. You just asked, how do you make meaning of disorder? And I think so much of telling our true stories is more about asking the right question than it is about finding the right answer. When you were writing, or even now, you know, looking back, do you feel like you found an answer to that question of making meaning of disorder? Is it still maybe an open question mark for you? I think it's kind of still open question mark. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping that this book will spark some conversation, yeah. even if it's just, you know, a small amount, and that that process will bring meaning to the situation. Yes. But I think that's also like at a certain point we can force tragedy to fit into a box and try to make it have this, you know, happy ending and it mm -hmm. won't. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to let the past sit too and you know mourn it. Let, yes. it, let it let it stand by itself and yeah. not try to mold into something triumphant. Yes, which was is what so, I'm so glad you read from the end because I think the end captures some of those like jagged edges so well. Yeah. Um, and you actually, you know, uh, you write in the book that you've always wanted to be a writer, loved writing, it was something that understandably got put on the back burner when life started happening, but you have such a wonderful story about how writing came back into your life, and I know some people here probably know it, but um, would you share that with us because it's really wonderful? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, it was very serendipitous. I say in the book that I want to be a writer since I was about like seven. Mm -hmm. One of my oldest friends is here in the audience. Um, hey! She's going to test her. Hello. Um, but I really wasn't pursuing it. Definitely yeah. after my sister died, I really wasn't going for it at all. I dedicated myself to psychology and mental mm -hmm. health, and I was doing a thesis in undergrad. I was totally on the, that track, wanting my PhD. And yeah. My thought was maybe someday I'd write a book when I was in my 40s, potentially. Or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I never, I really wasn't pursuing writing because I just think people get so discouraged. And then um, I submitted the Modern Love College Essay Contest in the New York Times and on a whim, mm -hmm. thinking no one would ever read it. So I wasn't mm -hmm. nervous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No one's going to read this. <laughs> <laughs> then I won um, the contest on my sister's birthday on the birthday week. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of strange. And I had said in my college dorm room, so I guess woo woo again. So yeah. Funny. But I said I said a lot in the dorm room, just like Kate, if you don't be writing about you, like this essay will never see the light of day. Like just like it won't. No one will read it. Don't worry about it. I'll never write about you again. And winning the contest on your birthday week, which is kind of more meaningful, is I was like, oh my god. Yes. <laughs> yes. Someone's listening. Um, maybe that's what's in my head, and that's how we grieve. But who knows? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that having this whole process from there on this book and having my sister story help me tap back into that, mm -hmm. that part of me that I love mm -hmm. was so special and that's because it felt like we were doing it together. Yeah. I know that Kate would write me notes and be like, you're going to be a famous author someday. Mm -hmm. All those, you know, she believed in me and she believed in my writing. Yeah. So that makes it more special too. It does. And can you tell us what was the title of your essay in case anybody wants to go look it up? Yeah. Um, it's kind of a long title. Yeah. <laughs> It's called, Years Ago My Sister Vanished, I See Her Whenever I Want. And it's an essay about how I was using Facebook and Instagram to kind of grieve my sister after she was gone by mm -hmm. continuing to text her and yeah. look at her page. And the thesis of the essay is essentially the question of how much holding on is too much holding on. Mm -hmm. And is technology helping us grieve better and remember better society? Or is it deterring us and making us be stuck in the past? Right. Or keeping it too alive. Mm -hmm. We want our Facebooks there when we also pass away. And did any of that original essay end up in the book or did it end up kind of just being this spark that lit the fire? I have like I mentioned like a, the essay itself mm -hmm. in the book. Right. I only actually use I think I used maybe like a couple of yeah. my favorite sentences. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, no, it was such a special way for it all to come together. Yeah. I I, I caught a lottery ticket. It was really mm -hmm. just yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us, you know, what are you, what are you up to now? What's next for you? So I graduate from Columbia um, in May, yeah. my MSW. And Amazing! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost there. Yeah, and through COVID, no less. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? I mean, it's all been COVID. Yeah, 
But once I have my degree, I'm hoping that I can continue doing advocacy, doing some public policy work, and also continuing to write. Yeah. I have some second book ideas I'm oh, playing with. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. I'm hoping just to keep trying to spread awareness. Yeah. And write about mental health from different angles. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, you know, something that you write at the end of the book, um, I once thought that loss made me bereft, but I am swollen with fortune. Um, I love that sentence, and I would love to hear, what do you think writing the book gave back to you? I think that it gave me, I think it gave me so many more memories of my sister back to me. Mm -hmm. I think it gave me some meaning in the sense that I was able to construct a narrative and try to piece together what happened to her, yeah. and that in itself is closure in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it, you know, we didn't get to have a funeral for her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we didn't have bodies. We couldn't have any ceremony like that. And I just got, I really wanted to honor my sister and just remember her life and have people get to know her. Yeah. And I think that for me, the book really is that. I, mean, I just hope people get to know my sister now and, mm -hmm. and you know, she's kind of immortalized in a sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope that's. I think it, it is, and I think what else is sort of immortalized, it is your sister, but it's also the love that you and your mother had for each other and you and your mother had for her, mm -hmm. and, and and that also makes it truly special. And um, what, what do you think, you know, if you could go back and tell yourself something at the worst of it, you know, what do you think, what do you, think you might say to yourself, or, or what do you think you might say to somebody who is going through something similar that, that you went through, that your family went through? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of things I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of, you know, more like medical stuff I would say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I also think that going back, I would give myself and other people going through it the advice that you have to help yourself before you can help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And especially for my parents who were, you know, the caretakers during this, they were just so overwhelmed by the process of trying to save my sister that they weren't taking care of themselves at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And I hope that families take a moment, if they can, and, you know, go, go, go to therapy yourself if you can afford it, or, yeah. you know, go to a treatment center, or do mm -hmm. something that's giving yourself the nourishment to be able to handle the situation. And then the second thing that I would say is that it's important to differentiate between the person you love and the person you're becoming right now. Mm -hmm. And understanding that this is the illness talking and it's not them. Mm -hmm. And I think that is easier said than actually internalized yeah. what's happening to you. But I do think that, you know, like blame it on mental illness. Don't blame it on the person. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, just try as much as you can possibly do it. Just differentiate. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And, and what do you hope people take with them after they finish the last page and close the book? I hope that people will see, you know, see the world a little differently, I guess, in the sense that maybe in a small way, like you are on the train, on the subway, mm -hmm. and you see somebody who seems unwell, who's preaching or saying something that seems disturbing or senseless, and instead of jumping to that person's on drugs or that person, something's wrong with them, thinking about maybe they have something that's neurological and, you know, hoping, hoping that that kind of compassion will trickle down to more systemic change in our society as well. Yeah. Beautiful. And um, I always like to ask authors, you know, what are you reading right now? Do you have anything, any books that you're reading that you're loving? Yeah. I'm trying to get lighter. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yes. I'm Same. reading funny things. <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with Susan Orlean. Uh-huh. So I love everything that she writes. Yep. Um, I'm reading all of her anthologies right now. Oh. Um, if I met her, I would just cry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of my like, phase I'm going through. Yes. You know, some David Sedaris. I'm just yeah. trying to focus on, you know, spreading more joy and happiness. It's And it's just as important, isn't yeah. it, as talking about the hard things. I do something where I try to read a serious book, fun book, serious book, <laughs> fun book. And it, it works out because it's kind of, it then mirrors life that way. Yeah. And any, any fun TV shows you recommend? Oh, I don't know if it's fun, but... <laughs> well, maybe fun. Interesting. Yeah, intriguing. I'm obsessed with The Dropout. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's not educational. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know why. Uh, it's about Elizabeth Holmes, who did Theranos. Yes. Um, I, I'm just fixated by it. 
I've been told I look like her. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's part of it. Every not, time I'm not wearing black turtleneck. I was going to say, every time I put on a black turtleneck, I down. <laughs> it's good entertainment. It's good yeah. to sell out, too. I always love to hear, you know, what, what other writers are sort of, you know, thinking and reading. Because usually it's just, it's a nice spread. It's not always, oh, you've got to read exactly the kind of thing you write. It's, you know, you've got to feed yourself all the different food groups, right? The scam there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> too. It's true. The one just came out. Yep. That's right. I have a lot of TV to catch up on. Yes. After, you know, <laughs> after May. After the bad day, right? <laughs> we'll find the time. Yes. And um, I think... Now is a good time to if, if to open it up for questions from the audience or from Crowdcast. I'll pass it back to Jamie. Yeah, so I think we are ready for some questions, and this has just been such um, a wonderful discussion. You guys are naturals together and um, bringing up so many um, really excellent points, um, especially about mental health. And you know, uh, before the program started, we were talking about you know mental health for teens right now and how challenging it is for all of our youth right now at the end of this pandemic and what they're going through. And and maybe this book can help some parents out there or some other people. I think anything we can do to destigmatize it um, is important. So are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, I'll bring the microphone over so our Crowdcast crowd can hear it. <laughs> okay, um, usually in a family with a mental <clears throat> illness like this that's so serious, um, the family gets involved in family therapy. Just wondering if your family did and had, did you find it worthwhile? I think that family therapy is so important. I think psychoeducation, education, especially with families, is the best thing you can do. Unfortunately for us, we, um, we tried it maybe like twice, but you know, we couldn't really afford to do family therapy or individual therapy beyond Kate's medical bills that we were paying for, so it became this kind of an, an unfortunate decision that had to be made, and I wish that wasn't the case. That's one of the things I think that we have to be investing more in community care. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I, I think it's you know um, so important that we find a way in this in the United States to prioritize family therapy the same way that we prioritize other medical necessities. Um, and I know too many people who would like to have some sort of therapy, but they can't afford it, and um, I think that's. You know, among other things. Anybody else have a question? Oh, right over here. Yeah. When you were talking about the differences that people have when it comes to people that are suffering with mental illness, um, it's that it's that inability to really be able to help them. Um, it isn't like you have a cut and you can put a band aid on it. You don't know what to do, and you don't know where to turn. And I think your discussion tonight helps people learn where to turn. I was wondering. If you felt you could share with us uh, some of the, from the idea of schizophrenia, what your sister was really going through at different stages, and how you dealt with that, and when you said you were away at college, did you have like a guilt feeling being away, like that was your solitude, and you weren't thrown into it as your parents were, and then how, if, if that was the case, how were you able to get yourself back into it again? Yeah, no, those are... Great questions. My sister passed away on my 17th birthday, so I actually didn't go to college after she was passed. So I was around, but I think as a kid myself, I was distanced from it, like my parents weren't. And just going to school in high school and having that break the day my mom didn't get to have, definitely had guilt about that. I worried about her a lot. I went to summer camp one time. I, I snuck my phone in. <laughs> I carved out the odor in. Put it in there. <laughs> Smuggled it in. So I, <laughs> it's like same contact. So. Yeah, that's definitely a big part of it. And I think to answer your first question as well, which is such a good point to highlight, is the confusion around phases. Um, with my sister, I talk a lot about how, that's why the book is, I make it clinically organized like that, so it seems concrete, but the whole point of it is that it isn't when you're going through it. So for us, we didn't know what was going on for so long. We, it, at first, it just started as you know, teenage trouble, rebellion, a big personality event, and then it starts, you know, mutating and becoming something really different. So by the end, it was like full-blown mania and hallucinations, and she had already suffered a traumatic brain injury at that point, so we also couldn't differentiate what's that. You know, it's just, it's such a mystery. Um, Susanna K. Halen on the cover says, calls it the impossible why of mental illness. I think that's such a good way to put it, because it's just, it's so confusing. Thank you. Um, are you still in touch with any of Kate's friends? Um, like, 
Does your family stay in touch with friends from, you know, before the mental illness or during, you know, what's happened? I know you weren't able to have a funeral or a memorial properly, but did that help give any closure? Actually, I think that one of the best parts about this book for me has been that it's made people reach out who I haven't heard from for years. So some of Kate's old friends have reached out to me, and some of them have said everything from, you know, small details like the way you describe her hands made me cry because it's so accurate or... Um, you know, she did this quirk, and I think about her, and said, what do you about her? And but also people reached out to me and said, I understand now what was happening with her um, a little better, because they, were, they weren't understanding anything like we weren't. So now they have maybe some answers as well, and I hope that brings them closure, too. Are there other questions from the audience? We don't have any questions online. Um, although I can see the, we have a, a big crowd with us online, which is great. And, and this will be going up on the library's YouTube channel, and hopefully it can then reach a lot of people who need to hear this. And um, I, I, but, but I think, you know, I have two sisters myself, and I think what it is, it is really a book about sisterhood, and I do like that. Um, and it's also just a book that really touches so many important touchstones. I do hope that you will all get a copy and read it and share it, because it is so important. And I just want to um, thank you, Kylie, for... First of all, having the courage to write this. I think it took a lot of courage to write this, and I hope you want to write other things. I'd like to see you try a novel, actually. <laughs> I think you would write a, a really great novel. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Amy Jo is agreeing. And Amy Jo is somebody who started out with, your first book was a memoir, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And now she's written, um, Amy Jo wrote Shiner, which was one of my favorite reads during quarantine. And if you haven't read Shiner, I, I really suggest that you do. And um, so, you know, there are, pe I, there, there are people who start out memoir and go back over to novels and dip around, and so I hope you'll be one of those people, and that we'll be having you back as a second-time author here at the library sometime. And um, Amy Jo, thank you again for coming out to interview. It's always a pleasure to have you here with us at the library. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay, so we have Labyrinth Books here, um, our local bookstore. They always support the library and our events, and so if you'd like to get a signed copy of the book, I suggest you do so, and for those of you online, you can go to labyrinthbooks.com. They carry Kylie's book, and if you put in the code word Letty um, when you check out, you'll get 10% off. So, um, and we like to support our local independent bookstore, so please make sure that you do. And um, this will conclude our formal portion of the event. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Thank you.